The 6 o'clock news starts right now. And we begin with late breaking news from the city of San Antonio tonight. As for the fifth day in a row, protesters gathered in downtown San Antonio. This is a live video feed from Sky 12 over Travis Park. Nine days since the death of George Floyd, who died in police custody in Minneapolis. A temporary curfew is going into effect tonight in San Antonio. The downtown business district will close to the public every night between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. Alamo Plaza will close between the hours of 7 p.m. and 6 a.m. We have watched this crowd get larger as the afternoon went on, and much like they have for the last couple of days, the protests have been largely peaceful, with the crowd chanting, people speaking, holding up signs. But for a couple of nights here, when the sun has gone down, it has been a very different story. Which brings us to these images of persons of interest from the San Antonio Police Department. Investigators say four people are wanted for engaging in rioting and criminal mischief from this past Saturday's uh, events in the downtown area. You may recall the protests turned violent with some protesters smashing glass and damaging downtown businesses. Anyone with information on who these people are you're asked to go to sanantonio.gov slash SAPD slash helping the police. That group of demonstrators downtown right now still growing as they head for Travis Park. And again, we should emphasize they are peaceful. Devin Clark is live downtown right now with what he's seeing there on the ground. Devin. EC Steve, we are out here at Travis Park, but today's protest started at San Antonio Police Department headquarters. Then the protesters marched to the Bear County Courthouse, back to SAPD, and now here to Travis Park. Right now, they're all holding their fists in the air in a show of solidarity. They were earlier chanting, no justice, no peace, no racist police. One protester took a holistic approach, burning sage, the crowd growing to what appears to be more than a thousand protesters right now. They all laid on the ground earlier, also chanting, I can't breathe. They spoke about how uncomfortable it must have been for George Floyd during his last moments. And the demonstration still growing, but marching and chanting aren't all they're doing to ensure that anti-racism policies are implemented and police brutality ends. I just don't think there's a better opportunity than now to take than to get people registered to vote. I uh, right before I came out here, I stopped by the uh, voting uh, the county voting office where I took a test and I became a deputy registrar where I'm now able to help people register to vote. We understand that protesters plan on demonstrating daily. They also say that they plan on keeping these demonstrations peaceful. Hopefully, nothing like what we saw last night. Of course, we know that San Antonio police say that they were forced to fire rubber bullets, wooden bullets into a crowd. San Antonio Police Chief Bullard McManus released a statement, and we have that on our website, KSAT.com. For now, reporting live at Travis Park, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. All right, thank you, Devin. Now, we would want to talk a little bit more about Chief William McManus's statement. He released a statement about last night and how SAPD handled that situation. It reads in part, quote, SAPD's primary objectives to allow peaceful demonstration, maintain order, and to prevent anyone from getting hurt were achieved, end quote. Chief McManus did talk about the two journalists who were hurt in last night's protest, saying, quote, it is my understanding that two local journalists were hit during the crowd dispersal. Although this was unfortunate, this was certainly not the police department's intent. During crowd dispersal action, officers cannot readily distinguish between peaceful protesters, media, and agitators once the situation has reached the boiling point. Again, those are the words from San Antonio Police Chief William McManus. A lot has changed for a former Bear County Sheriff's deputy in the last few hours. Arrested along with his wife this morning on the south side and now off the job. We just received the booking photos for 41-year-old Luis Lopez and his wife, 40-year-old Valeria Lopez. According to San Antonio police, he was taken into custody for shooting a gun in a heavy, heavily populated area. He's also been charged with resisting arrest. Lopez's wife was charged with interfering with a public servant. Officers were called to the 1800 block of West Maui Boulevard, where they say they found the former deputy heavily intoxicated. According to the arrest report, Lopez threw himself on the ground when police tried to handcuff him. He knocked a body camera off one officer and wouldn't allow the door to the police unit to close. 
As for his wife, officers say she interfered with the arrest by pulling on an officer and not listening to commands to go back in the house. So she was cuffed as well. The former deputy resigned from the Bear County Sheriff's Office earlier today. The fate of a one eighth of a cent sales tax is very much up in the air, but so apparently is the fate of current bus services. Mayor Ron Nuremberg announced during his state of the city address last night that city leaders will not be asking voters to divert a one eighth cent sales tax to via Metropolitan Transit in November as he planned. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger talked with the VIA board chair about what that means for the agency and VIA's riders. Mayor Ron Nuremberg called the decision to pull back from trying to divert more sales tax revenue towards transportation painful but necessary. But direct action to ensure a healthful economy, economic recovery is mandatory. It means rebuilding now. The tax money was originally supposed to fund transportation improvements at VIA. But with the pandemic causing an estimated shortfall of $126 million over the next five years, the agency says it needs the money just to maintain current services. The VIA board's chairwoman says without that sales tax revenue, we will start talking about service reduction as early as next year. We would eliminate some routes. We would make uh, frequencies uh, longer. I mean, it would take longer to, to uh, ride a bus. But Nuremberg didn't specify what might happen instead with the sales tax. The move appeared to leave the one eighth of a cent available for economic recovery efforts. But Andrade still hopes they can convince the mayor that using the tax for VIA is the best road forward. From essential workers to elderly to disabled citizens, they all rely on VIA for essential mobility. And we feel that we have a responsibility to be there to get them where they need to go. You can't have economic mobility without mobility. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. And new at six, among the myriad of problems blamed on COVID-19 is the disruptions the disease is causing in the criminal justice system. Though its impact there is far ranging, perhaps the toughest thing is the wait for justice for victims of crime. Paul Venema says the district attorney feels that though the waiting is difficult, a rush to trial could make them victims again. Since early March, when a moratorium on jury service was ordered, remote hearings like this are the only criminal legal business conducted in the courts. No trials. That leaves high-profile cases, such as the trial of Otis McCain, who's accused in the assassination-style slaying of veteran police detective Ben Marconi, on hold. It's very possible that these high-profile cases will be pushed back for, for a pretty significant period of time. Now, as it relates to Otis McCain, we have had the initial part of the jury selection process. Still, for the Marconi family and other victims' families, the district attorney's message is simple, but not pleasant. Please be patient. We're trying to do as much as we can remotely. Um, we all are working together, the courts um, and everybody involved in the system. Working together, but working slowly. We're trying to work within the confines of COVID-19. We're trying to work around the pandemic. He said his concerns are for the family's safety. Not only have they been victims of crime, but they may re-victimized by going down there and contracting this disease. So we're asking people to please uh, bear with us. Uh, please be patient. According to Ron Hell, the earliest a jury could be selected is late August. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. In New at Six, for nearly six decades, Sacred Heart Church has been serving our city's west side. Badly in need of repair, many of its parishioners rallied behind the effort to help with its $200,000 renovation. Completed in time for Sacred Heart's first mass on Sunday after the COVID-19 shutdown. Jesse DeGriato says they can already see what's changed from the outside. The color red is now in abundance at Sacred Heart Church on the walkway, the entrance, the newly installed pews, and the expanded altar, all for good reason. Red to fit the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Father Frederick Mazingo says what began with the new digital sign out front soon led to what else was needed, like installing security fencing around the property and replacing the nearly 60-year-old wooden pews put in back when Sacred Heart Church was built. They were, they were cracked and it was also a liability issue. Parishioners were tearing their clothes, getting splinters. Replacing them with far more comfortable pews became a top priority for Perry Cross, who oversaw the renovation, along with 
new flooring after the asbestos removal, topped off by restoring the dark wood ceiling and, of course, new bathrooms. But being Sacred Heart is on the west side. We don't have enough income. We had to go to the archdiocese to take a loan. The renovations were important for morale for the parishioners. During this time of the pandemic, uncertainty of the world. Parishioners like Jesus Piedra, the contractor. We and my team, uh, we are happy, very happy to do this. So were many who live in the area who also helped. They have seen the needs of our community and they came together. For the sake of their humble West Side Parish. Jesse de Goyado, KSAT 12 News. They did a great job. That's a beautiful church. Yeah, it is. Meantime, let's take a live look outside with live cam, 88 degrees out there. Yeah, 88, and it's going to get even hotter in the days ahead. If you think it's warm and sticky right now, just wait till you see what's coming down the pike with the seven-day forecast. Currently outside, we're at 88 degrees. That's at the airport. Dew point is 71. East southeasterly breeze at 10. As we go through the rest of the evening, temperatures gradually falling through the 80s, then down through the 70s. We've got some bigger heat to talk about coming right up. All right, we are waiting for the mayor and the county judge to give their daily briefing. The next to last daily briefing they'll give, we'll check in that a little bit later. With Andy Segovia, our city attorney, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight, we had a little bit of a jump in cases. We had 71 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our total to 2,953. 23 of those cases are from the community. One is an inmate at the Bear County Jail, and four are from congregate settings, such as nursing homes and long-term care facilities. We have an additional 43 that are pending determination. Unfortunately, we also do have three new deaths to report, which brings our total since the crisis began to 78. Uh, one woman was a, uh, in her 60s who died at Northeast Baptist and was a resident of the Rio Mission Trails nursing home. We also had a Hispanic female who was um, uh, a resident of the PAM specialty uh, facility. And then we had an additional uh, Hispanic male in his 60s uh, who passed away at Methodist. Uh, all three of those um, patients were in their 60s and we are praying for all of them and their families. In the hospitals, we have 90 patients COVID positive in the hospital today. That's down two from yesterday. 37 are in intensive care and 21 are on ventilators. We do have a very strong capacity in our hospitals, continuing 80% on ventilators and 32% uh, of staffed hospital beds available for uh, us, which means that our hospital system continues to be in strong and stable condition. Judge? Yeah, you know, I've been reading this book about this philosopher who happened to be the uh, catcher for the New York Yankees. He, um, I think, was the most valuable player for three years and hit 300 home runs, and he had a, always nice sayings. And one of his great sayings, it's not over till it's over. That's exactly what we're faced with right now. 71 new cases just today three people passing away in their 60s. And by the way, that is not old. That's young uh, in today's terms of how people are living today. And still 90 in hospitals. So as we move forward with some of the new openings that are going to occur, and um, you'll hear a little bit more in detail about them, uh, which means there's going to continue to be more activity in the community. Uh, the uh, Tobin Center was worried about fine, uh, about the Performing Arts Center, and they'll they'll be uh, be able to open now and and be able to I think go at 50 percent capacity I think, and restaurants will go up. So you're going to see more interaction as the governor takes each step toward opening up the economy, and so that means the simple lesson that the uh, mayor and I've been preaching: uh, face masks, social distancing, wash your hands. And I think it's really important. Uh, I was over at Home Depot today, and they require a face mask. So any business that can, they can. It's up to them. Uh, they should require that uh, because it's going to get more and more intensive uh, interactions between us. And uh, we need to be cognizant of the fact that it's not about us. It's about helping to protect the people that you're around. So I hope that we will keep up that vigilance as we 
keep moving forward. And as old Yogi said, it's not over till it's over, and it's not over. Yeah. Well, thank you, Judge. And he also said, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. <laughs> and and, yes, and I'll remind you, because a lot of people forget what our initial goal of this um, this process was, it is to flatten the curve. And when we talk about that, we want to make sure that we slow down the infection rate so that we have capacity to be able to treat people who do come ill and we protect those who are most vulnerable from this disease. And we've done an extraordinary job with that. The work that you're doing by physical distancing and wearing a mask to protect others uh, from you, potentially, who may be carrying the virus and not even know it, has done an extraordinary job. The, again, the Big Cities Health Coalition and Drexel University report shows that collectively this community has saved over 9,000 lives, and we built up hospital capacity. So if we continue to do our jobs and open up carefully, we can continue to see a healthful recovery of our economy and be prepared for possible second wave in the fall. So thank you for what you're doing. As always, uh, you can check out uh, the latest on COVID-19 on our website, covid19.sanantonio.gov, or you can text COSAGOV to 55000. As I mentioned, Dr. Kieran is here uh, to discuss discuss our health side of the uh, process, and, uh, and Andy Segovia, our city attorney, is here. Uh, there was a, a new governor's order issued today, and we're happy to take any questions. Uh, can, can Andy, can you go into a little bit about what the, the governor's order says, and, you know, how much longer does... Uh... All right, Yogi Berra was a catcher for the New York Yankees a while ago, and this was a very yoga, Yogi Berra-centric <laughs> <Yes. laughs> briefing tonight. The county judge Nelson Wolf saying it's not over till it's over, which was one of Yogi Berra's sayings, and he basically uh, quoted him because we'd had 71 new cases today, uh, 2,953 now the total of COVID-19 cases in San Antonio and Bear County. Yeah, unfortunately, three new deaths to report, all of them coming from nursing homes. And as Steve mentioned at the beginning of that briefing, this is the second to last daily briefing that the city and county will be holding tomorrow is their last regularly scheduled one. We know we've been bringing them to you every day at this time, but from here on out, they will be Tuesdays and Thursdays only. We want to let our viewers know that. Yeah, as long as circumstances can change, but right now they're planning on having two briefings a week. Tuesday and Thursday starting next week. All right, let's switch over to the weather side of things and some pretty impressive cloud formations out there, Adam. Uh, back to Yogi Berra yes. really quickly. I think he also said it's very difficult to make predictions, especially those of the future. <laughs> I swear, I think it's something along those lines. I can relate to that, Yogi. I can relate yeah, to that. Yeah. All right, so yes, we did have some interesting clouds, basically some towering cumulus tall clouds, but for the most part, not much rain from those clouds. Take a look at radar right now, and for the most part, we're dry, but there are some pockets of heavy rainfall. They're highly isolated, but where we are seeing the rain, it's coming down pretty good. Scattered about, about in parts of Lavaca County, DeWitt County, especially Wilson and Carnes counties, and just creeping their way into southern Atascosa County and Frio County down there. These aren't going to last all that much longer. These are going to be short lived. Once we lose the daytime heating, we lose our sunshine. We lose the energy for these and they fizzle out and then it'll just be a clear, pleasant evening with a few outflow boundaries out there, which will actually drop temperatures a little bit for some of us. Otherwise, a lot of sunshine. That's what we're looking at right now. Here's the bigger picture. Big blue H that's off to our west at the moment. That's over northern Mexico and creeping into parts of the desert southwest. That's going to be taking more control of our weather in the days ahead, and that's really going to boost our temperatures a bit as well. We could be looking at our first triple digit day coming down the pike, and we've got tropical storm Cristobal Crist Cristobal. I, I, I'm having a hard time with this one. I'll be honest, but I think, it, I think Cristobal, I think Cristobal. Cristobal. Yes, Chris. OK, Cristobal. whatever. It's a weak one, Cristobal. right? It's a weak one yeah. and it's going to push <laughs> northward, likely not threaten us. If it does any part of Texas, it would be some heavy rainfall. For the most part, we're in the 80s right now to near 90 tomorrow. A few degrees warmer. I think we'll start the day at 73, make it to 92 with a few coastal showers, but mostly dry. Then we get into the weekend upper 90s next week. We could be 101 by Tuesday. How's that? I'm That's glad. bad. I'm That's glad. bad. I'm, I don't like that. I'm glad whatever we call that tropical storm is a weak one. Yes, indeed. Yes. ball is a weak one and we don't have to deal with, you know, the pronunciation yeah. after this. Thank you, Adam. We'll be right back.
We are getting closer to the Spurs 2019-20 season resuming. The NBA has told the NBA Players Association that it will present a 22-team plan for restarting the season to the league's Board of Governors on Thursday, and it's expected to pass, according to reports. Teams will begin training at team sites in July, with play reportedly starting July 31st. The plan, if approved, would have 13 Western Conference teams and nine Eastern Conference teams. The cutoff being that teams must be within six games of a playoff spot at this point. The Spurs are four back. Sunday morning, Spurs guard Lonnie Walker IV joined volunteers in downtown San Antonio to help clean up after a George Floyd rally turned nasty when some protesters left the path of destruction. In response to what's going on across the land, the Spurs started Spurs Voices, stories of how racism impacts their organization. Here's part of Lonnie's four-minute segment. We have to find a way to make this res really resonate on everybody and keep it consistent because once this is over like what's next protest is over what's next what are we doing we got all our anger and all that all that screaming out but it probably hit some cops and they understand probably hit some people and it understands but we have to do something bigger than that as a community as a country as a city we have to find ways to connect between the government and the people because we're not connected at all Somerset High School running back Hunter Hernandez will play college football for Texas Lutheran in Seguin. Hunter signed his letter of intent this afternoon in the driveway of his grandparents' house across the street from the school. A special day indeed for Hunter and his family. I hope to bring just hard work and dedication to the program and help hope that I can support them. TLU knows what type of athlete they get. They wouldn't have been trying to recruit him if they didn't. Uh, Hunter ended up running 352 yards in one game and scored seven touchdowns. And uh, so that's, that's the type of kid they're getting. They're getting a great character also. After TAPS cleared the way to resume limited summer workouts June 1st, San Antonio Christian School said thank you very much. The Lions are back on campus and working out. We stopped by SACS Tuesday morning where 76 student athletes spread over three separate sessions, got after it, including 38 football players. They hope this is the first step to playing their 2020 regular season schedule. Uh, I was so happy. Uh, you know, the thought of not having a football season was a nightmare to me. Uh, and when I heard that we were going to probably have a season, I was just, I was uh, ecstatic. Whenever August starts and football comes back up, it's going to be all about conditioning and it's going to set us up for the season to have a successful season. Wagner High School varsity quarterback Isaiah Williams went above and beyond to work out when gyms were shut down due to COVID-19. Check this out. He built a practice net with his grandfather, Kendall Burleson, that serves as a batting cage as well as a football practice net. They built it together behind his grandpa's car shop, Speed Virus. Isaiah also waters and maintains the grass. He worked for his grandpa and saved up the money to buy footballs and other items needed to work out. So how long did it take them to build the net? Uh, not that long because he had like extra pieces like in a workshop so probably like like two weeks most of the pieces were already made so really we just we bought the net and like the football holes off amazon and we just put it put it all together wagner teammate darion thomas goes there to practice with isaiah we'll have more with isaiah williams sunday night on instant replay and we will hear from his grandfather kendall and why he taught his grandson the importance of building this practice net yeah, you know, how long did it take them to build it? Do they have the blueprints by chance? Because there's every high school quarterback would love to have one. Exactly, and, and Grandpa said that people reached out to them. Hey, do you have these? Can we get them on eBay? Yeah. And he's like, nope, one of a kind. Yep, yeah. custom made. Yep. Thanks, Larry. You got it. We'll be right back. Late this afternoon, elevated charges brought against former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin in an in-custody death of George Floyd. New charges against three other officers as well, seen in the widely seen video of the ultimately fatal arrest. ABC's Alex Perche has the latest from Minneapolis. Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin's charges upgraded to second-degree murder in the death of George Floyd. Today, the family of George Floyd visiting the site where he lost his life. I'm here reunited with my family, trying to get justice for my father. George Floyd was an American citizen, and George Floyd was a human being. George Floyd deserved humanity. Minnesota's governor also visiting the memorial this morning, staying low-key, reflecting and writing this message, Justice Now. 
the mother of his six-year-old saying this about his daughter, Gianna. He, I mean, that was his baby. He loved his little girl. What do you want people to know? Kind of I miss him. Floyd's death at the hands of police has sparked a worldwide call to action for more than a week. Protesters in New York City facing off with police on the Manhattan Bridge enforcing an earlier 8 o'clock curfew after violence and widespread looting occurred on Monday. Peaceful protest! The group of 5,000 marchers eventually allowed to peacefully cross into Brooklyn. There were instances of clashes in some cities. Pepper spray shot into crowds in Boston and in Portland. In Philadelphia, a controversial statue of former Mayor Frank Rizzo, known for discriminatory policies, removed overnight. But after days of images of cities set on fire and violence, the calls for calm seeming to be answered. In Los Angeles, a large group of protesters bringing their demonstration to Mayor Garcetti's front steps. Garcetti greeting them and taking a knee. There's a memorial service scheduled for George Floyd here in Minneapolis tomorrow. There'll be a public viewing in North Carolina on Saturday, and then there's a funeral service on Tuesday in his home state of Texas. Alex Brache, ABC News, Minneapolis. Pope Francis weighing in on the death of George Floyd, calling it tragic. He says he's praying for him and, quote, all those others who have lost their lives as a result of the sin of racism, end quote. He said that during his weekly prayer at the Vatican. He also said we cannot turn a blind eye to racism, and yet we must recognize the violence is self-destructive and self-defeating. The pontiff added, quote, nothing is gained by violence and so much is lost, end quote. New at 6, the summer fun begins for kids and families who are a part of Pre-K 4SA. Today, teachers and staff held an end-of-the-year parade. They were invited to decorate their vehicles and drive through and interact with teachers from a safe distance. Children also got a summer goodie bag, which included a promotion certificate, T-shirt, a book, and fun summer items. Staff says they want to make sure the families know that they are not forgotten. We'll always be here for our children and our families all through the summer. We're going to continue um, engaging them in events and learning, but also even next year we want to stay connected to them. And so this is a chance for us to send that message one last time. Pre-K 4SA teaches 2,000 students each year through its four education centers. All right, did you see that one? I'm assuming it was a teacher there that had yeah. that inflatable swan on. She's ready <laughs> for the pool. If she thinks she's ready now. Just wait until oh next week. Oh my, it's going to be perfect weather for that, Adam. Yeah, hopefully you have a good pool that's accessible because it looks like we're going to have our first triple digit day coming down the pike. Now we've been close before, but we may just do it early next week. So get ready for that kind of heat. Hello, June here in South Texas. Now I do want to share with you a nice photo that I received from uh, Daryl and Lavernia, and that's from a nice rainbow that was very short lived off in the distance. And we we're talking earlier at five how this is good rainbow making weather just like it was yesterday because of these little tropical downpours that hit as the sun angle gets lower in the sky. And if you're lucky, you can capture a nice little rainbow. And actually, this is the downpour that helped or some of these downpours around here. You see around Lavernia that flared up earlier very briefly, but enough to where once the rain has passed, if your back is to the sun, you'd sometimes capture a rainbow. And so thanks to Daryl for passing that along. You see near Stockdale, it just came so close to some of that rain, but most of it stayed just to the south of you. And a lot of it moved into Carnes County over the past couple of hours and has since dissipated right along 37. We're talking into Beeville, still some good downpours, but these are going to be short lived. I know they're out there. They're just not going to last all that much longer. As we lose the daytime heating, we lose these showers. So once the sun sets, pleasant evening and no more real chance of rain then. Look at the rainfall estimates today, and this is classic sea breeze uh, coverage of rainfall. You see most of it's between I-10 and I-37 with a few little showers making it into Atascosa County and even just barely clipping east and southeastern Bear County. But most of it is right along the coastline, and I think tomorrow it's going to be confined even closer to the coastline, and that's going to be the case the next couple of days. So don't be surprised if you're in DeWitt County, Lavaca County, Carnes County, Victoria, Goliad, or B counties, if you see a pop up shower or two the next couple of afternoons. But the vast majority of us out there, not going to see anything else. We're just looking at sunshine and higher heat coming our way. Big Blue H, 
We're all familiar with that. That's over northern Mexico. That's going to slowly be settling its way into town and influencing our weather even more in the days ahead. And in turn, we're just going to crank up the heat a little bit more. So tropical storm Cristobal, Cristobal, Max winds at 50 miles per hour, gusting to 65. And it's a broad area right now. It's basically a big rainstorm. That's what this is. And it's just dumping rain on the Yucatan Peninsula and parts of southern Mexico here. Notice Friday noon. It's still in that general area, right? It's not moving all that much. So this is a big rain event for them. Now, as it moves northward, it could strengthen a little bit as we get into the weekend and then potentially affect parts of anywhere the Texas coastline from about Houston eastward all the way to about Biloxi, Mississippi. That's the possibility and most likely with just a good amount of rain, but we'll keep a close eye on it and of course let you know what the latest is as we learn more. 90, that was our high temperature today. That's actually one degree below average. The morning low is 74 and that's three degrees above average. Right now we're mostly in the 80s. Devine's at 93, Pleasanton 91, Floresville at 87, and New Braunfels at an even 90 degrees. And then you get to Del Rio and a little bit warmer as usual, checking in at 95. The Deweys are way up there though. I mean, we're talking that oppressive humidity. It's really sticky outside, that tropical air that's in place, and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. We just have to get used to it. So looking at the forecast the rest of the evening, temperatures gradually falling off. I mean, we'll still be in the mid 80s at 8 p.m., 10 p.m., upper 70s, very sticky and humid. Tomorrow, good amount of sunshine. 73 in the morning and then 92 in the afternoon. And there's that wording for a coastal shower, right? Those of you closer to the Gulf coastline could see a few of these pop up showers with the sea breeze coming in, but by and large will be dry. All right, let's talk about cranking up the heat. 96 by Saturday. Yeah, been there, done that. No big deal. Then we get into Monday, Tuesday of next week and we could be talking 100 degrees at that at that wow. point. We have yet to hit 100 so far this year. And it's only June. Well, we're already in June. I was going to say May, but no, we're already in June. Yeah, yeah. it's about that time, yeah. I guess. All right, we'll be right back. No doubt they're dealing with a homicide. That's what San Antonio police are saying after a man's body was found on the west side, apparently shot to death. The unidentified man was found in the middle of Henry Street. That's not far from North Elmendorf. But officers tell our Katrina Weber they aren't sure if that was the actual murder scene. At a dead end on Henry Street, police work to figure out how and why a man's life came to an end. Officers found him here around 6 this morning after answering a call about someone who was injured and bleeding from his head. They later realized he was, in fact, dead from a gunshot wound. I don't see nobody, and I don't see that guy in the street. Seeing all the police cars this morning, though, came as a surprise to Gregoria Hernandez, who lives nearby. She says when she got home late last night, everything seemed almost normal. And I come back 12, 12 something midnight and I see the little car over there. She says that car parked on the normally empty street caught her attention right away. Police were desperately hoping something also was caught on camera. They went door to door looking for surveillance video, hoping to find out if the shooting happened here or somewhere else and who was behind it. Unlike the street, this case isn't exactly at a dead end. Police say although they have little to go on right now, their investigation is just beginning. Sometimes happen, va a pasar algo, I can feel. Ananda says she often gets a feeling when something unusual is going to happen, and this time was no different. But police need more than a hunch to solve this case. They're looking for evidence and witnesses. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. In the buzz today, dairy farms in Wisconsin are hoping to make the internet a lot cheesier on Thursday with the world's largest virtual cheese party. They're asking cheese lovers to take a virtual cheesecation in the Badger State. Cheesecation. Thursday, also National Cheese Day. The group plans to market by offering people an opportunity to meet Wisconsin cheesemakers online. The event will also include cheese tastings, trivia, giveaways, surprise guests. If you're interested, you have to register for free on Zoom. That's where the party will be hosted. Maybe bring, you know, some salsa or chips or something just in case so. <laughs> 
<laughs> Love it. Well, it's almost cool enough outside to take that evening run. And if you're a jogger, you probably already know that today is National Running Day. Whether you pound the pavement alone or run with a group, the first Wednesday is your day. National Running Day started for old pros and beginners alike. For veterans, it's a day to reaffirm their passion for running, and it's a chance for beginners to make a life-changing commitment. Running organizations have been celebrating National Running Day for about 10 years so far. And if running isn't your thing, but you still want to celebrate something, how about the humble egg? Because today is also National Egg Day. Eggs are full of protein, vitamin D, and other nutrients that your body needs. This is a busy day. Yeah, it is. One single egg has only 75 calories, which health experts say is a great calorie to protein ratio. And the ways they can be cooked vary quite a bit. Scrambled, hard boiled, fried, sunny side up. Add some cheese, vegetables, meat, make it an omelet, put it on a hamburger. Hard boiled. Hard boiled, whatever you want on this National Egg Day. Running, eggs, and cheese. I thought you were going to make a pun there. Something I was going to say. about like make it an excellent day or something could, like yeah. that. Yeah. This okay. day's all it's cracking. <laughs> something like that, maybe? We'll be right back. It's a segment we do at 630 called KSAT Q&A, where we take your questions and our questions to some of the experts out there and get straight to the facts. We are joined like we are every Wednesday by Mayor Ron Nuremberg. Mayor, thank you for joining us right after your briefing. I know the decision was made to institute a curfew tonight for the downtown district starting at 9 p.m., I believe. What went into that decision for you? Yeah, well, obviously, consultation with our public safety and our police chief and city management uh, and also just a, a clear eyed uh, sense of what's going on out there. There are, are peaceful assemblies and uh, righteous protests going on about what we've seen across the country uh, and uh, specifically the murder of George Floyd and what we're doing as a country to uh, end uh, some of the systemic uh, uh, systemic issues that we have within our criminal justice system. Those are important things to do. Uh, but we also want it done safely and um, peacefully. And that's been do that's been happening this entire time in San Antonio. Uh, but we know that they're being disrupted, particularly after hours at night uh, by by a few folks that are getting in there with other m other motives. Um, so to help with that and make sure that the people who are peacefully assembling, that the general public and property is protected, uh, these are measures that are are being recommended, and we're we're going to take uh, in uh, for the you know for the time being uh, temporary. But um, I think it's necessary for us to protect the peace. Now, Mr. Mayor, you released a statement earlier today where you talked about asking the chief to communicate the rules of engagement so demonstrators will understand the crowd dispersal policies. Right. What are those rules of engagement? Just so anybody watching here tonight is clear. Right. Well, again, we want to protect people. We want to protect life and safety. We want to protect uh, bystanders. We want to protect the protesters uh, who are exercising the First Amendment rights. And we also want to protect property. The problem is there are a few folks that are, are uh, disrupting and risking everyone. And we, I don't want to see anyone hurt. Um, and so if someone is instigating, uh, we really need to call them out so we can focus on that person who is disrupting. Uh, but the trouble is when you get nighttime and there's crowds of people and, and you know, things are being thrown, police also have to protect themselves. So um, what, what's happening is projectiles are being thrown and only at that point will the crowd start to be dispersed by, um, by, the, by the police. And so we want to make it very clear that if projectiles are being thrown, if hard objects are being thrown and people are, are failing to listen to the warnings to, to stop and disperse, uh, then that's when um, some of these tactics are going to have to be used. Again, um, non-lethal, uh, but we have to get people out of the way so people aren't, uh, aren't also hurt, the police as well as the bystanders. But the best thing to do is to, again, peacefully assemble. And if you see disruption, call it out. The police are there to help you as well. I think we have about 30 seconds left in this interview. Are you concerned that this is a concerted effort by some of these agitators to do what you're seeing after dark? You know, I, I think that uh, we have to be aware of that. And, uh, you know, it, it does appear that there is a, a um, coordinated effort to disrupt 
peaceful protests, and it's happening largely after dark. We're seeing it in other cities. And so we're going to be prepared, and we're going to have to do what we need to do to protect the life and safety of the members of our community. That includes people who are peacefully protesting. That includes bystanders. That includes property. That also includes the police. Mayor Ron Nuremberg, thank you so much for your time. We'll see you again for another live interview during our 10 o'clock newscast. Thank you so much. Thank you, both. thank you, Mayor. By the way, you saw a little shot from police headquarters of the protest that is still going on. Peaceful protest right now outside public safety headquarters downtown. We'll be right back. And before we go, we want to give you one last look outside of police headquarters right now with Sky 12, where crowds have gathered in protest of the killing of George Floyd, as well as uh, there in uh, to support all the racial issues and injustices that, um, excuse me. Yeah. I misphrased that, so um, I apologize. Yeah. Stand for justice. Stand for justice.